Hello and happy, well it's a Saturday for me, so happy Saturday. I am trying to get pulled up my intro. I need to connect this guy. We are doing chapter 29. I always have to adjust this every single time because sometimes it's too high, sometimes it's too low. There it is. I don't know what is up with this bra strap, but it keeps falling. Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Brie Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. It's like you. If you enjoy our show, be sure to follow us so you get all the new episodes. If you want to see exclusive behind the scenes of our show, join our Patreon. Patreon. We would also love for you to drop us a rating on your favorite podcast platform and share our show with your friends. You can catch us on all the social medias at Bite at a Time Books. Time Books. We are now part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you ever wondered what inspired your favorite classic novelists to write their stories, what was happening in their lives or the world at the time, check out Bite at a Time Books behind the story wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we'll be continuing The Three Musketeers by Alexandra Dumas. Switch you to the chapter. Do, 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 do. I have to like size it so I can read. Because um, it starts out really, really small. Okay. Jeez. Still mess. 29. Hunting for the Equipments The most preoccupied of the four friends was certainly D'Artagnan, although he, in his quality of guardsman, would be much more easily equipped than Monsieur's the Musketeers, who were all of high rank. High rank. But our Gascon cadet was, as may have been observed, of a provident and almost avaricious character, and with that, explain the contradiction, so vain as almost to rival Porthos. Porthos. To this preoccupation of his vanity, D'Artagnan at this moment joined in an easiness much less selfish. Selfish. Notwithstanding all his inquiries respecting Madame Bonacieux, he could obtain no intelligence of her mons... Mm. Selfish. Where am selfish? Okay. Selfish. Notwithstanding all his... Uh... Selfish. Notwithstanding all his inquiries respecting Madame Bonacieux, he could obtain no intelligence of her. Intelligence of her. Monsieur de Treville had spoken of her to the Queen. The Queen was ignorant where the mercer's young wife was, but had promised to have her sought for. But this promise was very vague and did not at all reassure D'Artagnan. For D'Artagnan. Athos did not leave his chamber. He made up his mind not to take a single step to equip himself. Equip himself. We still have 15 days before us, said he to his friends. Well, if at the end of a fortnight I have found nothing, or rather, if nothing has come to find me, as I, too good a Catholic to kill myself with a bullet pistol, bullet pistol. I will seek a good quarrel with four of his eminence's guards, or with eight Englishmen, and I will fight until one of them has killed me, which, considering the number, cannot fail to happen. Fail to happen. It will then be said of me that I died for the king, so that I shall have performed my duty without the expense of an outfit. An outfit. Porthos continued to walk about with his hands behind him, tossing his head and repeating, I shall follow up on my idea. My idea. Aramis, anxious and... Ne mm. My idea. Aramis, anxious and negligently dressed, said nothing. Said nothing. It may be seen by these disastrous details that desolation reigned in the community. <clears throat> the community. The lackeys on their part, like the coursers of Hippolytus, share... Uh, the community. The lackeys on their part, like the coursers of Hippolytus, shared the sadness of their masters. Hippolytus. I have no idea. Masters. Mascaton collected a store of crusts. Bazin, who had always been inclined to devotion, never quit the churches. 
Blanchett watched the flight of flies, and Grimaud, whom the general distress could not induce to break the silence imposed by his master, his master. heaved sighs enough to soften the stones. stones. The three friends, for as we have said, Athos had sworn not to stir a foot to equip himself, went out early in the morning and returned late at night. Late at night. They wandered about the streets, looking at the pavement as if to see whether the passengers had not left a purse behind them. Behind them. They might have been supposed to be following tracks, so observant were they whenever they went. They went. When they met, they looked desolate at one another. Nope. They went. When they met, they looked desolately at one another, as much as to say, have you found anything? anything however as porthos had first found an idea and had thought of it earnestly afterward he was the first to act first to act he was a man of execution this worthy porthos porthos d'artagnan perceived him one day walking toward the church of saint lou and followed him instinctively instinctively he entered after having twisted his mustache and elongated his imperial which always announced on his part the most triumphant resolutions as D'Artagnan took some precautions to conceal himself, Porthos believed he had not been seen. Been seen. D'Artagnan entered behind him. Behind him. Porthos went and leaned against the side of a pillar. D'Artagnan, still unperceived, supported himself against the other side. The other side. There happened to be a sermon which made the church very full of people. Full of people. Porthos took advantage of this circumstance to ogle the women. Thanks to the cares of Mousqueton, the exterior was far from announcing the distress of the interior. Interior. His hat was a little napless. His feather was a little faded. His gold lace was a little tarnished. His laces were a trifle frayed, but in the obscurity of the church, these things were not seen. And Porthos was still the handsome Porthos. Porthos. D'Artagnan observed, on the bench nearest to the pillar against which Porthos leaned, a sort of ripe beauty, rather yellow and rather dry, but erect and haughty under her black hood. Black hood. The eyes of Porthos were furtively cast upon this lady and then roved about at large over the nave. Over the nave. On her side, the lady, who from time to time blushed, darted with the rapidity of lightning a glance toward the inconstant Porthos, and then immediately the eyes of Porthos wandered anxiously. anxiously. It was plain that this mode of proceeding piqued the lady in the black hood, for she bit her lips till they bled, scratched the end of her nose, and could not sit still in her seats. Her seats. Porthos, seeing this, retwisted his mustache elongated his imperial a second time and began to make signals to a beautiful lady who was near the choir and who not only was a beautiful lady but still further no doubt a great lady great lady for she had behind her a negro boy who had brought the cushion on which she knelt and a female servant who held the emblazoned bag in which was placed the book from which she read the mass <clears throat> and a female servant who held the emblazoned bag in which was placed the book from which she read the mass. The mass. The lady with the black hood followed through all their wanderings the looks of Porthos and perceived that they rested upon the lady with the velvet cushion, the little negro, and the maid servant. servant. During this time, Porthos played close. It was almost imperceptible motions of his eyes, fingers placed upon the lips, little assassinating smiles, which really did assassinate the disdained beauty. Disdained beauty. Then she cried, ahem, under cover of the mea culpa, striking her breast so vigorously that everybody, even the lady with the red cushion, turned round toward her. Toward her. Porthos paid no attention. Nevertheless, he understood it all, but was deaf. It was deaf. The lady with the red cushion produced a great effect she was very handsome, upon the lady with the black hood, who saw in her a rival really to be 
Ow. <sighs> that hurt. The staff. The lady with the red cushion produced a great effect, for she was very handsome, upon the lady with the black hood, who saw in her a rival really to be dreaded. A great effect upon Porthos, who thought her much prettier than the lady with the black hood. A black hood. A great effect upon D'Artagnan. A black hood. A great effect upon D'Artagnan, who recognized in her the lady of Nyung, of Callias, and of Dover, whom his persecutor, the man with the scar, had saluted by the name of my lady. <clears throat> D'Artagnan, without losing sight of the lady of the red cushion, continued to watch the proceedings of Porthos, which amused him greatly. Him greatly. He guessed that the lady of the black hood was the procurator's wife of the Rue A Ars, which was the more probable. greatly. He guessed that the lady of the black hood was the procurator's wife of the Rue A Ars, which was the more probable from the church of St. Lou being not far from that locality. Locality. He guessed, likewise, by induction, that Porthos was taking his revenge for the defeat of Chantilly when the procurator's wife had proved so refractory with respect to her purse. Her purse. Amid all this, D'Artagnan remarked also that not one countenance responded to the gallantries of Porthos. Porthos. There were only chimeras and illusions. But for real love? For true jealousy? Is there any reality except illusions and chimeras? Chimeras. The sermon over, the procurator's wife advanced toward the holy font. Porthos went before her and instead of a finger, dipped his whole hand in. Hand in. The procurator's wife smiled, thinking that it was for her Porthos had put himself to this trouble, but she was cruelly and promptly undeceived. undeceived. When she was only about three steps from him, he turned his head round fixing his eyes steadfastly upon the lady with the red cushion, who had risen and was approaching, followed by her black boy and her woman. And her woman. When the lady of the red cushion came close to Porthos, Porthos drew his dripping hand from the font. The fair worshipper touched the great hand of Porthos with her delicate fingers, smiled, made the sign of the cross, and left the church. The church. This was too much for the procurator's wife. She doubted not there was an intrigue between this lady and Porthos. Porthos. If she had been a great lady, she would have fainted. But as she was only a procurator's wife, she contented herself saying to the musketeer with concentrated fury, Eh, Monsieur Porthos? Porthos. Goodness. Concentrated fury. Eh, Monsieur. Goodness. Concentrated fury. Eh, Monsieur Porthos? You don't offer me any holy water? Holy water? Porthos, at the sound of that voice, started like a man awakened from a sleep of a hundred years. Hundred years. Ma Madame, cried he, is that you? How is your husband, our dear Monsieur Coquenard? Coquenard. Is he still as stingy as ever? Where can my eyes have been not to have seen you during the two hours of the sermon? The sermon. I was within two paces of you, Monsieur, replied the procurator's wife, but you did not perceive me because you had no eyes but for the pretty lady to whom you just now gave the holy water. Holy water. Porthos pretended to be confused. Ah, said he, you have remarked. I must have been blind not to have seen. Not to have seen. Yes, said Porthos, this is a duchess of my acquaintance whom I have great trouble to meet on account of the jealousy of her husband and who sent me word that she should come today to this poor church, buried in this vile quarter, solely for the sake of seeing me. Seeing me? Monsieur Porthos, said the procurator's wife, will you have the kindness to offer me your arm for five minutes? I have something to say to you. Say to you? Certainly, madame, said Porthos, winking to himself as a gambler does who laughs at the dupe he is about to pluck. At that moment, D'Artagnan passed in pursuit of my lady. He cast a passing glance at Porthos and beheld his triumphant look. The 
doesn't work. Eh, eh, said he, reasoning to himself according to the strangely easy morality of that gallant period. There is one who will be equipped in good time. Good time. Porthos, yielding to the pressure of the arm of the procurator's wife, as a bark yields to the rudder, arrived at the cloister St. Magalior, a little frequented passage enclosed with a turnstile at each end. Each end. In the daytime, nobody was seen there but mendicants devouring their crusts and children at play. Children at play. Ah, uh, Monsieur Porthos, cried the procurator's wife, when she was assured that no one who was a stranger to the population of the locality could either see or hear her. Ah, uh, Monsieur Porthos, you are a great conqueror, as it appears. Appears. I, madame, said Porthos, drawing himself up proudly. How so? How so? The sign's just now in the holy water, but that must be a princess at least, that lady with her negro boy and her maid. And her maid. My God, madame, you are deceived, said Porthos. She is simply a duchess. A duchess. And that running footman who waited at the door, and that carriage with a coachman in grand livery who sat waiting on his seat. On his seat? Porthos had seen neither the footman nor the carriage, but with the eye of a jealous woman, Madame Coquenard had seen everything. And everything. Porthos regretted that he had not at once made the Lady of the Red Cushion a princess. Princess. Ah, you are quite the pet of the ladies, Monsieur Porthos, resumed the procurator's wife with a sigh. With a sigh. Well, responded Porthos, you may imagine, with the physique with which nature has endowed me, I am not in want of good luck. Good, luck. good lord how quickly men forget cried the procurator's wife raising her eyes toward heaven. toward heaven less quickly than the women it seems to me replied porthos for i madame i may say i was your victim when wounded dying i was abandoned by the surgeons i the offspring of a noble family who placed reliance upon your friendship i was near dying of my wounds at first and of hunger afterward in a beggarly inn at Chantilly, without you ever deigning once to reply to the burning letters I addressed to you. Addressed to you. But Monsieur Porthos, murmured the procurator's wife, who began to feel that, to judge by the conduct of the great ladies of the time, she was wrong. She was wrong. I who sacrificed for you the Baron de, I know it well, the Comtesse de, Monsieur Porthos, be generous. Generous. You are right, madame, and I will not finish. But it was my husband who would not hear of lending. Hear of lending. Madame Coquenard, said Porthos, remember the first letter you wrote me and which I preserve engraved in my memory. <laughs> Oof. The procurator's wife uttered a groan. Besides, said she, the sum you required me to borrow was rather large. Rather large. Madame Coquenard, I gave you the preference. I had but to write to the Duchess. Uh. Rather large. Madame Coquenard. Mather. Rather large. Madame Coquenard, I gave you the preference. I had but to write to the Duchess, but I won't repeat her name, for I am incapable of compromising a woman. But this I know that I had but to write to her, and she would have sent me 1,500. I'll go to the chiropractor in a couple of days. I'm ready for it. 1,500. The procurator's wife shed a tear. Shed a tear. Monsieur Porthos, said she, I can assure you that you have severely punished me, and if in the time to come you should find yourself in a similar situation, you have but to apply to me. To me. Fee, madame, fee, said Porthos as if disgusted. Let us not talk about money, if you please. It is humiliating. Humiliating. Then you no longer love me, said the procurator's wife slowly and sadly. Porthos maintained a majestic silence. Silence. And that is the only reply you make? Alas, I understand. Understand. Think of the offense you have committed toward me, madame. It remains here said Porthos, placing his hand on his heart and pressing it strongly. Strongly. I will repair it. Indeed, I will, my dear Porthos. Porthos. Besides, 
What did I ask of you? resumed Porthos, with a movement of the shoulders full of good fellowship. Good fellowship. Alone. Nothing more. After all, I am not an unreasonable man. I know you are not rich, Madame Coquenard, and that your husband is obliged to bleed his poor clients to squeeze a few paltry crowns from them. Crowns from them. Oh, if you were a duchess, a marchioness, or a countess, it would be quite a different thing. It would be unpardonable. Pardonable. The procurator's wife was piqued. Was piqued. Pleased to know, Monsieur Porthos, said she, that my strong box, the strong box of a procurator's wife, though it may be, is better filled than it, those. <laughs> was piqued. Pleased to know, Monsieur Porthos, said she, that my strong box, the strong box of a procurator's wife, though it may be, is better filled than those of your affected minxes. Minxes. That doubles the offense, said Porthos, disengaging his arm from that of the procurator's wife. For if you are rich, Madame Coquenard, then there is no excuse for your refusal. Your refusal. When I said rich, replied the procurator's wife, who saw that she had gone too far, you must not take the word literally. I am not precisely rich, though I am pretty well off. Pretty well off. Hold, madame, said Porthos. Let us say no more upon the subject, I beg of you. You have misunderstood me. All sympathy is extinct between us. Between us. In great that you are. Ah, I advise you to complain, said Porthos. Porthos. Be gone then to your beautiful duchess. I will detain you no longer. And she is not to be despised in my opinion. My opinion. Now, Monsieur Porthos, once more, and this is the last, do you love me still? Me still? Ah, oh, madame, said Porthos in the most melancholy tone he could assume. When we are able... Mm. When he could assume... When we are about to enter upon a campaign, a campaign in which my presentiments tell me I shall be killed. Can't go away. Pop up. Let me figure out how to turn off the YouTube ad, uh, like recommended pop things. Be killed. Oh, don't talk of such things, cried the procurator's wife, bursting into tears. Something whispers me so, continued Porthos, becoming more and more melancholy. Melancholy. Rather say that you have a new love. New love? Not so. I speak frankly to you. No object affects me, and I even feel here, at the bottom of my heart, something which speaks for you. For you. But in fifteen days, as you know, or as you do not know, this fatal campaign is to open. I shall be your feet. Mm. Excuse me. Is to open. I shall be fearfully preoccupied with my outfit. Then I must make a journey to see my family in the lower part of Brittany to obtain the sum necessary for my departure. My departure. Porthos observed a last struggle between love and avarice. Avarice. And as, continued he, the Duchess whom you saw at the church has estates near those of my family. We mean to make the journey together. Journeys, you know, appear much shorter when we travel two in company. <clears throat> in company. Have you no friends in Paris, then, Monsieur Porthos? said the procurator's wife. Procurator's wife. I thought I had, said Porthos, resuming his melancholy air. But I have been taught my mistake. My mistake. You have some, cried the procurator's wife, in a transport that surprised even herself. Herself. Come to our house tomorrow. You are the son of my aunt, consequently my cousin. You come from Noyon in Picardy. You have several lawsuits and no attorney. Can you recollect all that? Recollect all that? Perfectly, madame. Come at dinner time. Very well. Very well. And be upon your guard before my husband, who is rather shrewd, notwithstanding his seventy-six years. Years. Seventy-six years? Peste, that's a fine age, replied Porthos. Porthos. A great age, you mean, Monsieur Porthos. Yes, the poor man may be expected to leave me a widow any hour, continued she, throwing a significant glance at Porthos. Porthos. Fortunately, by our marriage contract, the survivor takes everything. Everything. All? Yes, all. Yes, all. 
You are a woman of precaution, I see, my dear Madame Coquenard, said Porthos, squeezing the hand of the procurator's wife tenderly. Wife tenderly. We are then reconciled, my dear Porthos, she said, simpering. For life, replied Porthos in the same manner. Same manner. Till we meet again, then, dear traitor. Till we meet again, my forgetful charmer. Tomorrow, my angel. Tomorrow, flame of my life. I don't know why I just let that lead out so long. <laughs> Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. If you enjoy our show, be sure to follow us so you get all the new episodes. If you want to see exclusive behind the scenes of our show, join our Patreon. Patreon. We would also love for you to drop us a rating on your favorite podcast platform and share our show with your friends. Your friends. You can catch us on all the social medias at Bite at a Time Books. Also, be sure to check us on our website, www.biteatatimebooks.com. We are now part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you ever wondered what inspired your favorite classic novelists to write their stories, what was happening in their lives or the world at the time. World at the time. Check out Bite at a Time Books behind the story. Tuesdays wherever you listen to podcasts. Casts. Again, my name is Bree Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow while we take the next bite of the Three Musketeers. <clears throat> so my podcast is a little bit weird because um the um, because my book changes every time. So sometimes like with Jane Eyre, I had quite a bit of listeners with Three Musketeers. It's gone down a little bit, not a lot, just a little bit. Um, but it's funny how like, you know, not every person is going to like every book and, uh, you know, some months I'll do better than other months, and that's fine. Um, this book's actually 60-something chapters, so it's about two months of stuff. But I still have a good time, and a lot of these are books that I have not read. So it's fun to get to hear new books or read new books. All right, well, that is all for Chapter 29. I'm going to do Chapter 30 next. <laughs>